This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. What's going on? Hey, thank you guys for all the super chats there. Yep, we are now on the home stretch. Got uh, what? Nah, eight di days less until left until donation night. All right. So, um, any support you want to give the channel and the charities at the same time? Uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, by the way, just before the show tonight, there was another YouTuber making another slamming video on me. And they, what they do is they try to, uh, this guy is trying to gain, I'm not sure what's going on right now. It's like, how do we make our uh, channel popular? Ooh, 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 let's make, let's bash gray again. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. You know, this is a person that wore a skeleton mask while covering true crime. I mean, how disrespectful is that, by the way? So he'd be covering true crime and then... Uh, one day, out of nowhere, absolutely unprovoked, he trashed me. Just, I, I couldn't believe it. I go, why are you talking about me? I don't even know you. And then I was sent a picture of him and his name. And I said, hey, you know, I actually know who you are and what your name is. Okay, you don't need to hide by, you know, you keep hiding behind your skeleton mask. And you feel like you can say whatever you want. But I know your name and I know what you look like. And then he said... Then you know what he told his viewers? You know what that idiot told his viewers? He said that I was doxing his kid. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? I, I, I didn't even dox anybody. I just said, I know what you look like, and I know what your name is. Okay? And he goes, you're doxing my kid. How dare you? Because if you gave up my name, they'd know where my kid... Uh, wow. Okay? That's what he said back then. Now he's out there telling people that I threatened... the to dox his kid. I, I'm, I, God, I'm just, oh man, I don't even know what to tell you guys. I'm getting so frustrated with it. I don't even know what happened to my screen right there. What happened? What happened? What happened? <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what I just did to my screen. Is there a button that you hit that, wow. I like tossed something on the ground and I must have hit something there. Hold on. Hmm. I'm going to have to close that down. Does that work? Okay. Wow. For a second there, it like totally did something strange to my, uh, to this other window. It filled up my entire window so I couldn't see anything, but I'm just so frustrated right now, you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm so frustrated. I just want to do shows. I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore. It's, it's disgusting. I mean, the, these... I mean, it, you know, the thing is, is I, that's what I'm saying, everybody. If you're going to be a, U, a true crime YouTuber or a YouTuber in general, I think you should have to use your real name. Okay? You shouldn't be able to hide behind some bull crap. Uh, a, a skeleton face with a fake name? Are you kidding me? Who the hell are you? God. All right. So, anyways, I'm just getting really tired of it. I thought we just moved by it, and then we got another clown. Part of the same crew, by the way. <laughs> you know? So it makes you kind of wonder what's going on there. A little strange. Uh, I've never talked about the guy on my channel ever and uh, don't know what's going on. So, And I would never talk about him. He's absolutely god-awful at what he does. So, um, And I guess that's one of the problems. When you suck, you have to make up some shit where you, you try to uh, attack other people so you can be cool with the gang. Everybody else is cutting him down why don't I jump in too yeah so 
Anyways, thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you up there to Lee D with uh, joining in on the wave, Christine Falk, and uh, Darlene Brown. Yarg, Marty McFly. Okay, so again, it's another person that's putting out false information to boost, try to help boost. They, they're, they're trying to jump on the train. Okay. Um, he even sent me an email once where he lumped, he, he said, he, he put my name on there and then his email back was how stoned he was and that's why he, he did it. <laughs> what, a, what an idiot. I won't say his name though because I don't want people to go over there and attack him. All right? you know, he's just uh, another pile of crap. As far as I'm concerned. All right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'll show, though. I can show you. You know, maybe in my, uh, like, uh, you know, top tier, yeah. oogla, not oogla boogla freaks and above. I'll show you the, the emails. He's freaking nuts. All right. All right. Where's the. Uh <phone rings> And he, you know what he does? He always threatens to attack me, too. If I ever see you at CrimeCon, man, I'm going to beat you up. Uh, 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 I don't like you. Wow, you sound like a violent jackass. Okay, nobody's ever done anything to you or threatened you, nor have they done anything to you. <laughs> God, the only thing I ever said was, I know what you look like and I know what your name is. God, unbelievable. Uh, let's see, where, where was that, uh, I was just doing something here. Okay. Uh, by the way, I put out another one of the stories, Kit's story today. It didn't seem to get put into the viewing track, though. It didn't have very many views when it was, uh, like, right away, so you can always tell. Like, it, it, it premiered, you know, so people could actually talk in there. And there's only like 10 people watching, and that never happens when I do a premiere. So I don't know what happened uh, on YouTube if they just put it in a weird uh, situation. But well, here's the thing: is uh, like what he said one time. He goes, "Gray is uh, he attacks women on his channel," and then I was like. Well, here's the thing. 90% uh, of the people that watch my channel, 80% are females. And if one of them says something, I'm going to go, oh, that's ridiculous. Is that really attacking a female? It's just, you're just a person. I mean, aren't we past all that yet? Aren't we supposed to all be the same? And you say, if somebody says something, you go, that's ridiculous. And then you fight back. I don't consider your gender whatsoever when I'm making a comment back. That's, I, I can't stand that shit. What am I supposed to do? Uh, wait a minute. Your name is Jordan. Um, wait, are you a man or let's say uh, you a guy or a girl, Jordan? Okay, you're a girl. Okay. Very great. A great comment. Absolutely wonderful. Perfect thing to say. Well, no, no, actually I was a guy. Sorry about that. Oh, well, what a garbage comment that was. That was an absolute... I mean, I'm not going to be like that. I don't care what your gender is. It doesn't mean a damn thing to me. Okay? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? <laughs> God. All right, you guys. Let, let's just do let's do true crime. Okay? Yeah, it is. It's actually demeaning to women to say that. Like any time you argue with a woman, all of a sudden you are attacking. A woman, you're anti-woman because you're arguing with them. Now, if you ever hear me say something about their gender in the attack, then you can, you know, you go off on me. I, I'll expect it. Yeah, I treat everybody exactly the same. <laughs> you're so mean. Gray, you're so mean. <laughs> You, you saw it, everybody. I got called so mean, and there's a so mean emoji. Guess what that means? It immediately means that I am now in jail. We haven't even started the damn show yet. How do you like that? Wow. 
Man. <laughs> Ice Falcon 224 said, Gray, you are so mean. Followed up by Nelly Bug's so mean, so mean emoji. Sandy stole three triple. And Zozo's jail in a Christine Falk three jail fit. Oh, my God. Look what Lori Fisher did to me right there. Lori Fisher has me in there for a month. That's crazy, Belinda. <laughs> wow, look at that. Brandy Bradford is, is bailing me out right away. Oh, wait, hold on a second. We, we've, got a, we've got a strong contingent of negative bail here. Hold on. That was 20. We're now at uh, minus 14. Makeshift shank and spoon. So that wasn't for that either. Uh, Lee D uh, sent in negative. I just want to make sure that somebody didn't click a button to have a more negative. I can get out of here. Uh, I think there's a time limit we're going to do. 19, 18, 17, 16. Hey, thanks, living it, for upgrading. Hit the like button. Let's blow up this channel. <laughs> oh, there we go. Gray, here's Bill. Well, I'm definitely out now. Thanks, Amber Maiden. <laughs> oh, shit. All right, we're out of there. Oh, and Lee D. Oh, man, no bail. Man, you got that no bail in a little late there. Oh, here's some bail. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amber Maiden. Hold on, hold on a second. So thank you to Randy Bradford, Lee D. Sozo for the makeshift shank. <laughs> uh, Christine Folk. Uh, Am Amber Maiden said, great, here's bail, I think. This is so frustrating because you don't do drama and it takes away from what we could be doing. I know. I know. It sucks. It just absolutely sucks that the... I don't even want... I don't... I just want to do a show like I was happy today. And now we got another loser uh, that's actually out there slamming the channel. Uh, thanks, Lee D. Fine. No bail. <laughs> and then your gypsy... Ah, here's some bail. Great. Right? And then uh, Emily Flotilla said... No bail honey buns. Oh, by the way, Emily, I sent you an email. Uh, somebody wants your real name, and I can get that I can give to them for Facebook. All right. So there you go. I know what your real first name is, I think, but uh, I won't say it on here. Well, thank you guys very much. All right. So you can tell. Look how excited uh, Blue and Chloe are over there. Well, thank you, Linda Howe. As in, Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations and Crop Circles. And there it is, Brandy Bradford. Yeah, they, pretty much, Sandra, but, you know, it's just very descriptive. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can't go to, like, uh... Dick Sporting Goods and say, hey, by the way, do you guys have a shank up there? Yeah, yeah, sure. We got a couple here behind the counter. They're $19.99. Now, look at this one here. It's made out of a Coke bottle tightened up 15 times. It's amazing. Okay. Emily Flotilla. I always thought your name was actually Emily Flotilla. Except for the fact that I remember you gave me your different first name. It was for its first Sarita, by the way. Merry Christmas, Lori Fisher. When you're on top, there will always be haters. Yeah. Yep, that's true. <laughs> I'd never heard of you that are these two cases for tonight. Never heard of them. Wish it was... Oh, that's, that's all right, Linda. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you can't afford to send anything in, I don't want anybody sending something in, or if money's tight or anything like that, you know, do your own thing, you know. I just do my show every night, and hopefully we can hit certain goals here and there so that we can continue to do what we're doing. Some nights are better than others. You know, we know how it goes. And those nights make up for the other ones.
Thank you very much. Ah, get it, everybody? Zach, get it? All right. <clears throat> so while you guys are chatting there, I'm going to just make these couple folders here. And if you missed last night, we gave $250 to, uh, more to the Polk County Sheriff's Office for a lady who got robbed at a Christmas presents. Sure, that'll help. What's going on here? I can't seem to get to... And that really only happens because of you guys. All right, so now I got the two folders in there. All right, we'll start off with uh, 1981. Is that moving? Blue. Oh yeah, I guess that's, uh, thought it was frozen. Sensory ice cream. Not sure what that means. Yeah, this is back in uh, I think it was 1981, December 23rd, which is tomorrow, but 20, but uh, 40 years ago. Hmm. All right. Well, looking forward to the last art part. So this is how it went back then. All right. A 19-year-old Valdez woman driving home from a Christmas party, and this is in uh, North Carolina. So let me go to uh, just get in that general area for now. All right, so there we are. We're in Valdez. What was that case over here? We just flew by it. Which case was that? That was the Brittany, no, wait. Summer, no, that's Summer Wells. <laughs> Look how close that is. That's pretty weird. Hmm. How far away is that? I just was, saw it sitting there. It was only 80 miles away. So this is Valdez here, okay, Valdez, North Carolina. So a 19-year-old Valdez woman driving home from a Christmas party died early Wednesday when a bullet slammed into the trunk of her car, passed through two seats, and struck her in the back. Man, how would, how would that happen? They don't know if it was deliberate or accidental, said a spokesman for the Burke County Sheriff's Department. Detectives from... That department and the State Bureau of Investigation, SBI, spent Wednesday interviewing friends and relatives of the victim, Rhonda Hinson, but had developed no new leads. Hinson's body was found lying in a ditch beside her tan 1981 Datsun on North Carolina 350 near Valdez city limits. So this is, is that 350 right there? North Carolina, 50, hmm, let's see, 3, 350. Yeah, I don't know, it doesn't seem to, I wonder if it's this 40 here now. Highway 40, maybe that used to be 350. Normally, you, if you just typed in like Highway 350, it would be there. Mm. 
Nah, it doesn't even exist anymore in North Carolina. Probably got rid of it, I guess. Uh, Dotson on North Carolina 350 near Valdez city limits. Earlier, she had attended a Christmas party for employees of the Hickory Steel and Iron Company at the American Legion building in Hickory. So let's see where that is. American Legion building. American Legion Hickory. That's probably the same, I would think. American Legion Post Fairgrounds. I wonder if that's it right there. It says American Legion Post. Uh, let's do this one. Uh, I bet it's this one right here. American Legion. American Legion. That's uh, another fairground one. But that could have been where the dance was, right? What do you guys think? Fairgrounds. Two different fairgrounds. I'm going to just guess here, I guess. Hey everybody, William Zambrano's back. <laughs> Where you been, William Zambrano? <clears throat> Henson's body was found lying in a ditch beside her tan 1981 Datsun. Um, it was <clears throat> at 1.10 a.m. Earlier, she had attended a Christmas party for employees of Hickory Steel and Iron Company at the American Legion building. She worked as a key punch operator for the firm. We think she may have been changing gears when she was hit, the sheriff department spokesman said. Her car was in neutral. It had swerved off the road and stopped. That's kind of interesting. Hmm. She was found lying in a ditch next to it. A motorist spotted her body. Could just be when she was hit, her body spasmed or something. You know, her hand might have been on the gear shift because a lot of people drive sticks your hands on there more than normal. I mean the uh, automatic drivers. And it could have been when she was hit, her foot went down, but that'd be pretty complicated, I guess, to shift. Well, I guess all you have to do is hit the clutch and then put it into neutral, which wouldn't be tremendously hard, but I don't know. Yeah, she could have just been changing, shifting gears. A motorist spotted her body and reported it to Valdez police who turned the case over to Burke County authorities. The bullet traveled through a, a lot before it hit her, the sheriff department spokesman said. That suggests a high-powered rifle, but nothing like that has been confirmed. Yeah, so it seems like somebody intentionally shot at that car, but, I mean, was it just some random killer just trying to kill people? Uh, news of Henson's death spread around her hometown by word of mouth Wednesday. Hey, thank you so much, Brandy Bradford. Merry Christmas to you, too. She said, uh, Merry Christmas, Gray and Freak family. Much love to all. Ah, so nice. I got so, I got so many nice people that are on this channel. And yet, I'm so mean. How did that happen? God. Man. Unbelievable. I'm so lucky. Oh yeah, let me turn the bots on. Hold on. Oops. Hmm. Did that done? Okay. They might work here in a minute. Thanks, Brandy Bradford, even though Gray's mean. Thank you. What do you mean, even though I'm mean, Mary Lou? That's kind of mean. I was just jumping on the, the bandwagon for the haters. Oh, okay. That's all right. I get it now. You're trying to get some cred for yourself, right, Mary Lou? Yeah, why not? Oh, wow. Even Mary Lou has turned against me. <laughs> Can you believe that, Coffee with Connie? Mary Lou turned on me. Unbelievable. Oh, by the way, you know what? You want to hear something funny? Uh, so, the, you know how the show ended. This is... Okay. <laughs> Here's the case against... 
the rewind mode. Check this one out, Brandy. Listen to this one. Uh, you know how I'm always saying, I don't like rewind mode. I don't like rewind mode. And here's why I don't like rewind mode. Is that 20 minutes after the show ended, uh, somebody called me on Zoom. Okay? And uh, they were really upset about the loss of Michael Cat. And I talked to them for, you know, 10 minutes or so. And, and it was a good call. I think it was, you know, like I was, I felt really bad for her and it was a good call. But wasn't that funny, though? It's like, I mean, the show's been over for a long time. But when you watch it, oh, there's the number. So I should just be able to call it up, right? So I thought that was pretty funny. But it was, it, uh, she was a really nice person, so it was all right. Yeah. Yeah, she was really upset. Going back time in 70 years. All right. A motorist spotted her body and reported it to Valdez police who turned the case over to Burke County authorities. The bullet traveled through a lot before it hit her. The sheriff department spokesman said, this is a little bit, you know, we got the uh, Melissa Pesky case where she got shot while driving down a freeway. But I think that her husband had something to do with that, allegedly. That suggests a high-powered rifle, but nothing like that has been confirmed. News of Henson's death spread around her hometown by word of mouth Wednesday. It was a shock, said Valdez firefighter Leroy Melton, especially since nobody knows how or why she died. I knew her for a long time. She worked part-time with my wife at a cafe before she got that other job. She was a pretty good girl. Pretty good? What do you mean? All right, so now we're moving on to the... This is a month later here. Looks like that's the family. Yeah, everybody's all devastated there. Yes, and that's what hairstyles look like <laughs> in the 80s right there for some people. Or the, you know, the feathered back look with the... Yeah. Uh, Judy Hinson of Valdez said that at, at times during the past month she has felt like committing suicide so she can be with the slain with her slain daughter. Wow, that sucks. But her 13 year old son Robert, who's been much stronger than us, she said, told her that she's not that that's not the answer. Uh, he convinced me if I live the best I can, I would be with her someday. Judy Hinton said. Rhonda Hinton, 19, was killed apparently by a sniper at 1.54 a.m. December 23rd as she drove from an office Christmas party in Hickory. Burke County Sheriff Detective John McDevitt said someone fired a shot at her car. The bullet went through the car's trunk, uh, rear and front seats. Wow. I mean, how high-powered is that? through the metal of two sheets of metal, like the, the metal that goes into the trunk and then out of the trunk, through the back seat, through the front seat, and hit Rhonda in the heart. I mean, my God, that is, like, insane. The shooting was about a mile from Hinson's home. Rena Banfield, an administrative assistant at the Valdez Police Department, said Friday... A $6,263 reward, 5000 from government, Governor uh, Jim Hunt, the rest from donations has been offered to anyone with information. Meanwhile, Judy Hinson and her husband, Bobby, are still trying to figure out why their daughter was killed. She was the happiest person, said Judy Hinson. Everybody who knew her knew her by her smile. She was the type of friend who never held a grudge or made an enemy. The friends she, she had in the first grade were still her friends when she died. She said she hopes a reward leads to the capture of her daughter's killer because she wants to ask, uh, ask one question, why? So ask one question, why? I've got to know why somebody would do it, she said. The funeral was four weeks ago, and that's a long time to wonder. Hinson, who has 
not gone back to her work as a daycare center since her daughter's death said she's spent days trying to come up with the answers. Judy Hinson said her daughter deliberated a long time before deciding to go to the Christmas party. A homebody, she didn't like driving at night, her mother said, and she didn't know whether she would like going to an office party. Wow, so she wasn't going to go, wasn't going to go, wasn't going to go, and then went. Uh, since this was her first real job, she decided she had better go, Judy Hinson said. But before she made that decision, she had changed her mind a dozen times. Like, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going. Hmm, that's crazy. And then a month later, these are all like on the 23rd of the month, these articles coming out. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty powerful. I mean, that's almost military grade, isn't it? You know, maybe like a M20, uh, let's see, what is it? M, is it 22, 4 or something like that? No, it was a M80, no, I can't remember now. I actually used to play this online role-playing game. It was americasarmy.com. You learn how to use all the, you know, all about each of the weapons, you know, the... The like M two twenty four with the grenade launcher, I think. The saw, maybe that was the M two twenty three. Yeah, hell, I can't remember anymore. But I think M twenty four was a sniper rifle or whatever. But it was a pretty cool game. But uh, man, that's crazy that it could go through the trunk, and then through both sets of seats, and then hit her right in the heart. I mean, wow, could have hit anywhere else. I'd like to know exactly where it was. Hopefully we can get more details because then you could see, uh, try to look at a spot where somebody could actually be laying prone and make do a shot like that. Because you can't, you couldn't do that standing, holding it. There's no way in hell you could do that. You'd have to be down, scope on a tripod, the whole breathing thing and everything, and just, and then as you're breathing out, you pause, boom, right? Yeah, so, I don't know. Even in that game, they, you had to do this breathing thing. It was it was weird. Yeah, I was thinking maybe, you know, it's usually something like that. It could just be a random kill, but also a sniper. You know, like the the sniper, Malvo, and, and the, the other guy. Yeah. Judy Henson's Nightmare is two months old. Began December 23rd, shortly after midnight. When she walked to find, she waked to find her 19-year-old daughter, Rhonda, had not come home from a Christmas party. Shortly before 3 a.m., a knock on the door told her why. Rhonda Henson had been found shot dead beside her 1981 Datsun. So it's like she pulled over and then actually got out of her car and fell into the ditch. Only a mile from her Valdez home in Burke County, a single bullet had gone through the car trunk and back and front seats before killing her instantly, authorities determined. Well, how could it be instantly if she was found outside the vehicle? It appeared to be the work of a sniper, but the Burke County Sheriff's Department and the State Bureau of Investigation found themselves boxed in, uh, boxed in for leads. The same things that boxed in the investigation are the substance of Judy and Bobby Hinson's nightmare. Rhonda Hinson was a predictable young woman, open, a, um, a no smoking, no drinking, no partying type, no enemies, no quarrels, no heavy problems with anybody. Wow. She had even, uh, she had difficulty deciding to attend the Christmas party of the Hickory Iron and Steel Company, where she had won her first full-time job six months earlier as a key punch operator. But friend Shirley Pittman didn't want to go unless Henson went. So her friend was like, come on, come on, that must make her feel really guilty. And a third female friend didn't want to go unless both of them went. So they met at Shirley's home near Morganton to go together. I don't think... I haven't found where they mentioned any addresses yet, so it kind of sucks. But 
Yeah, there goes my stomach. So that was February 23rd. Now we're May 23rd here. The gunman who murdered 19-year-old Rhonda Henson uh, Valdez two days before last Christmas took more than her life. The bullet that sliced through the rear of her car as she drove home from a Christmas party is also destroying her parents. Judy and Robert Henson have changed from a close-knit couple who built their lives around their children in, into confused, bitter people. They have become overly protective of their remaining child, 13-year-old Robbie, and hatred is burning for the murderer who killed the da their daughter. Wow, it's just, that's a, what a nightmare. See, you know, these killers don't give a shit about stuff like that, right? Um, almost every one of the, you know, especially when it's a missing child, a missing child or a murdered child, it seems like always really affect the parent. You know, one of them probably blames the other every time. Like, well, why would you let him go to the park? I always said that I didn't want him to go. You know, it just sucks. I never thought much about capital punishment before, said Judy Henson. Now I want it for people like this. In the beginning, if someone had admitted killing Rhonda and had said it was a mistake, I might have forgiven him. Not now. Give me five minutes alone with him. Uh, when they find him, I will claw out his eyes so he can never do this to anyone else. Wow. Rhonda Henson was from a small town so, prop, so proper that she hesitated to go to an office Christmas party until another woman said they would go together. As she drove home alone, someone presumably parked beneath Ah, oh, there we go. An I-40 bridge over Mineral Springs Road. There we go. There we go. Now we can do this. See, I was wondering about that. If you there has to be like a, an area, I, a bridge was pop is was in my mind, you know, because that's what on a highway. That's the only thing that you could um, lay on that would be like that, right? Unless it's sort of on a curve and then a straightaway, and then you could be in the woods back there. So let's see where, uh, so we saw I-40 right here. Now let's just see where Mineral Springs Road is. Ooh. Wow, so Mineral, that's Charlotte there though. Is it still there? What was the name of this town again? It was uh, Hudson the Hickory. Okay. No Spring Road. Oh, that's why I did it. Hickory. Okay, there's Mineral Spring Springs Road. And does that go way up here then? And run into Yeah. And there's I there it is, right there. Mineral Springs Mountain Road, and here's I-40, so an overpass, huh? Wow, so you think maybe up here on the, let's see if it looked different, how far back, wow, they have uh, 1944 on a map here, how <laughs> okay, 1993. So it looked similar, 1993, not, yeah, nothing's really changed. So somewhere around in this area, we'll just put a pin. Second. 
Look how many. You guys see how fa how many things are zipping by? It's barely moving because we have so many cases. That's where it pres presumably parked beneath an I-40 bridge over Mineral Springs Road. So beneath I-40 bridge over Mineral Springs Road. So they were on Mineral Springs Road. Let's see what that would look like. So you're, this is Mineral Springs. And what they do, like climb up and lay in the grass right up. Oh wow, wouldn't that <laughs> wouldn't that be freaky? They they go up here and they just sort of lay there as cars are zipping by. And nobody can see them. Wow, that's crazy. Or even on that side, either way, right? I, we don't know which way she was heading though at this point. But maybe they'll give more details here in a minute. It ripped through the back seat and the front seat and threw Rhonda Henson's chest. She died instantly. Her 1981 Datsun rolled backwards into a ditch. Police found her outside the car. Judy Henson thinks the killer may have pulled Rhonda from the car after it stopped. She can't imagine why. Hmm. Well, it could be that she didn't die instantly, like you guys are saying, and that she opened the door and got out. You know, I mean, that, that makes mo the most sense to me. Because you're just assuming she died instantly. You don't know that. I mean, I, you've seen people get shot in the heart and they walk around for like 10 seconds and then they just collapse, right? Despite intensive investigation and $20,000 reward, no arrests have been made. A rumor discounted by investigators said the killer had been hired to kill another woman in a car well this, this reminds us of that other story uh, I don't remember the name of the case but remember the girl that went to the phone booth and was abducted and her boyfriend chased and then his car broke down and you know they never caught up with them and I don't remember if her body was found either but she was murdered but they killed the wrong person they actually found a note uh, to somebody else that was uh, to kill a girl with the exact same name and the the hitman in that small town picked the wrong girl not that it would you know I mean it's shitty to kill the other child too but you don't remember that one yeah let me see if I can just type that in Yeah, hold on. Wasn't so, I think it's, yeah, Angela Hammond. I think that might be it. This one right here. Who was, was kidnapped, mistaken identity, and solved abduction of pregnant Angela Hammond 30 years ago. It was meant to target the daughter of a police informant who helped bust drug ring newly revealed chilling ransom note. So uh, that's Angela Hammond. You guys remember this one now, right? Yep. And look at this. So the letter was postmarked April 4th, 1991, the exact date that Angela Hammond was abducted late that evening. The informant's wife and his daughter, also named Angela, were living in Clinton. So, the, so look at that. This other person, let's see, Angela Hammond was abducted. The informant's wife and his daughter, also named Angela, were living in Clinton, Missouri at the same time. And then the note said, Hello, no, we know who you are. People like you deserve what you get. We know where your foxy daughter is at. She will see us soon. Tell so-and-so she has our deepest sympathy, that's probably the mother, in her further loss. Goodbye. Isn't that ridiculous? So they killed 
the wrong Angela Hammond, even though the other Angela Hammond shouldn't have been killed either. But this one is a completely innocent. There's not even any sort of family association of something negative to whoever did it. Right? So, anyways. That was... Uh, I was happy to find that so fast. Uh, just typing in the description led right to it. The Hinson home, 70 miles from Charlotte in Burke County, has been has become a private prison for the young woman's survivors. Uh, let's see. Robbie is the center of focus in the grieving parents of the grieving parents. Um, I've been smothering Robbie, Judy Hinson said. I don't want to do this to him. Part of me says there is no reason why someone should be waiting out there to kill the other member of this family. But I'm afraid for Robbie. I'm afraid for us. Day and night, Judy Hinson lives in fear. Four months after the murder, she finally opened drawn window curtains to let light into the immaculate home that had become a gloomy dungeon. I am still afraid to go downstairs to the basement, she says, but I'm getting better. I went to a psychiatrist for a couple of months, but I have stopped going. I was taking a lot of Valium. I quit taking it. I've got to face this somehow. She spends long, empty days at home. I am closer to Rhonda here, uh, she says. After Rhonda's death, her parents closed off her, probably her bedroom, maybe, or... Closed off her room. We said nothing in her room would ever be touched, Judy Hinton says. For four months, I couldn't open that door. Whenever I passed it, I turned away, trying not to see it. But last week, my sister came. We opened the room and gave away everything of Rhonda's except a few things I just had to keep. Judy Hinson is remarkably candid about her personal changes in their lives. Yeah, I kind of like her because she's really honest. She and Robert Hinson met in Granite Falls, South Carolina. With him, she found her first real love. They married when she was 16. Until Rhonda died, she considered their life perfect. They didn't have much money. They didn't need much. Everything centered around their children. Our whole ambition in life was to raise our children right, agrees Robert Hinson, a thin, tired man with rapidly graying hair and a face filled with a private agony. Now grief and guilt invade every private moment at this uh, Wall Denisian Bakery's job. Robert Hinson can forget a few minutes can forget a few minutes at home there's nothing else to think about he said yeah you almost would have to move right i mean it's just something like that is so you know i don't know like you you take the items and you move at least now you can start new memories where could you imagine having i think that'd be absolutely brutal i never even really thought about it like that like you know you live in a house where you have this kid and they ran around, you had Christmases, Thanksgiving, birthday parties and all this stuff. And then they get murdered. And then you're sitting in that house every single day, remembering all of those things, looking at every item and reliving the good times, but it's torturing you because you now you know that they're dead, right? So it almost feels like if you moved you know, you, you remember those things, but you you could at least um, start making new ones. Ah, oh, man, it's that's brutal, you know. Yeah, jeez. The Hinsons avoid things they once enjoyed together. See? See how shitty that is? Now they probably don't even go to movies or, you know. The Hinsons avoid things they once enjoyed together. Doesn't seem right to have fun without Rhonda, Judy Hinson explains. Friends have tried to console the Hinsons. They say they know how we feel, Judy Hinson says, but no one knows how we feel unless the same thing has happened to them. A couple of incidents have upset the Hinsons. One involved a minister Judy Hinson considered a friend of the family who never called or came to visit, she says. 
Let's see, a couple of incidents have upset the incidents. One involved a minister, Judy Hinson, considered a friend of the family who never called or came to visit, she says. After I wrote him, he explained he had not come because his congregation would be critical of him for ministering to someone outside his district. Oh, shut the... She says, I thought he was a man of God. I didn't know God had districts. <laughs> All right, hey, you, you know, I don't care what you, you gotta like this lady, man. <laughs> God, what in the hell's going on here? After I wrote, let's see, a couple of incidents. One involved a minister, Judy Henson, considered a friend. What a dick, God. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure your, uh, your congregation would have been extremely upset with you for consoling the mother of a murdered child. Yeah, they they just would have been, how dare you? I tell you what, if there's a church out there that um, would be upset that your pastor went to another church, I mean, I mean, another person outside of the district to console them in the time of a murder, that is the shittiest church there ever was. And it, it should be shunned and made mocked and made fun of. Okay. Uh, but I actually think he just lied about that. He just didn't want to go. You know, being, he didn't know what to say, even though he's the, you know, the man of the claw. You know what I'm saying? What a joke. There's no way in hell anybody in that church would have gave it a, gave a damn. His story is full of shit. Uh, four Morganson families were able to peace or pierce the detective uh, protective blanket okay so four morgan morganton families were able to pierce the protective blanket of the henson uh blanket the hensons have drawn about themselves each family had lost children in an explosion last year yeah and as a matter of fact sometimes they're the only people that get it you know other people that had a tragedy that's why you always see these parents of missing children uh, congregate together. And, uh, you know, what's sad, too, is like, it seems like sometimes you have these organizations where you have people congregating together that have the same tragedies, but then when one of them gets resolved, sometimes you're not part of the group anymore, you know? Like, they find your child in the woods and, you got to have your quote closure and which doesn't exist and now you're just not one of them now you know and an, and an organization called parents of murdered children founded in cincinnati by the parents of another 19 year old girl who was murdered has made contact judy henson wrote asking for advice on coping she got a personal letter from the founder robert they should have named this pastor over here Robert Herlinger, he's this person at uh, that organization. It is natural to feel hate, he wrote. It is a feeling we can't control. You may discover the strength of that hate will ebb away. Uh, not likely, says Judy Henson. She clasped her hands tightly together to uh, still a tremor. Salvation for Judy Henson may lie in children. She kept a foster child for four years before Robbie was born, and she thinks that maybe it is time to find another child that needs a home and love. Hmm, that was very nice of her. I talked to social services about it, she says. They are interested. I hope, I hope they will think I am stable enough. I think that would, would have really helped her, I bet. Although, I hope she isn't wasn't too like you know you can't go to the movies you can't go you know because I can definitely see being like that you you become a helicopter mom no matter what I would imagine all right now we're gonna go to uh, <laughs> it is it is Zozo a lot of just crazy shit out there unbelievable makes me angry. All right, so this one is uh, Woman's Family Seeks Answers. So now we're 1989, uh, eight years later-ish. Nearly eight years ago, Rhonda Henson died in, on a Burke County highway 
when a bullet sliced into her car and struck her as she drove home from a company Christmas party. Authorities still don't know who fired the shot around 1 a.m. on December 23, 1981, or whether it was an accident or murder. I think the angle of that makes it a murder. Um, if it came in from the side or, uh, you know, you can, if it's from the side, like in the pesky case on a straightaway, that's a murder too. It seemed really obvious because the odds of a bullet doing that, but the angle meaning it was low coming through the trunk, how could it have been an accident? Because somebody shooting out of a car it would have a lower, it wouldn't have hit the trunk. It would be coming from a higher angle down into it, right? All right. After an upcoming recreation of the killing on NBC Unsolved Mysteries, they may get answers. The program, which reenacts crimes nationwide in hopes of uncovering clues, will air a segment on Hinson's death sometime. This winter. Hmm. I have to go check that one out. See if you guys can find the episode of that. Rhonda Hinson on Unsolved Mysteries. A crew of nine has tackled the case since last Wednesday, interviewing family, friends, Burke law enforcement officers, and taping footage across the county. Uh, they'll return to their Burbank, California studios today, or tonight. Editing the footage could take weeks. The assignment is intriguing because something was troubling Hinson in the weeks before her death. Hmm. Though she shared the problem with no one. So how do you know there one? Said Kathleen Crom Cromley, producer of Unsolved Mysteries. Hinson's family doesn't know what went wrong, only that Hinson took frequent showers and kept mostly to herself. Hmm. A few days before her death, Henson and her father, Bobby Henson, stopped for gas at a neighborhood convenience store. She said in the car, Daddy, I have to tell you something, but I am afraid it's going to make you mad, said an aunt, Linda Elliott. Ooh, wow, what if she was having sex with somebody and she was pregnant and that's why she was taking those showers, but I guess they would have found out she was pregnant in the autopsy. Daddy, I have to tell you something, but I'm afraid it's going to make you mad. Henson never told her father. God. They have no idea what it was, Elliot said Sunday. It's driving them crazy. God, wouldn't that drive you crazy? Put a one if that would drive you crazy, never knowing the answer to that. Yeah, it could have been abuse too, right? Like uh, an uncle or, you know, some, something crazy. And then she was killed to silence her. But I mean, how did, how, what kind of timing is that? I mean, it's a little bit like in the, um, what is it? You know, the, the police officer in the Bardstown mystery, how it was timed in a way where they put the tree down so that the cop would stop. I wonder if it was like that. The person knew that they would be driving on the freeway at night. I even saw them leave and quickly drove up, you know, into a spot and waited. But I don't know, how would you recognize the actual vehicle? Yep, everyone put ones. A graduate of East Burke High School, Henson had just turned 19 and worked as a key punch operator at Hickory Steel and Iron Company. So none of her friends knew her. She had a boyfriend, oh there you go, and her, fa and her family, father, mother, and younger brother was close. On the day of the killing, Henson went to work as usual, then attended the company Christmas party in Hickory with a friend. Afterwards, she took her friend home and headed towards her. Okay, now we've got her home. Her. Now we can know the direction on here because it, it would be heading home. So 1009 Hillcrest Street. Right there. So see, they're going to go east or west from here. Oh, so it was on that road. Wait, no, that means she... Well, we still don't know then. <laughs> because the sniper... She was shot on as she was about to... Probably almost like she was going to exit here. 
So she could have been going this way or that way still. So man, that didn't help at all. Had she lived, you know what? You know what sucks about this? Had she lived here or there, you'd know which direction the shot came from. But we don't get to know at all because she lives on basically uh, the same, this Mineral Springs Mountain Road is the same road that she lives on, although the name changes after it crosses over to um, Eldred Street. Ah, oh, man, that's brutal. How could that, that that's just... Wow, somebody actually drove on that little side. So right there, that cute little brick house. I'm sure it's the same one. Looks like a lot of the houses do in uh, Pennsylvania. So apparently, God, I guess, uh, but here's the thing. If you were up here, there's no way, but her car was shot on the freeway here. So it must have been pulling off somewhere to get home. So from that way, you'd be going like this and like that. So either one of these, but I guess that would still be, they never said the on-ramp though. And it was shot in the back, so it would be... Well, how could it be shot in the back of the car? Regardless. How the hell was it shot in the back of the car, no matter what you look at here? So, if Because you, if you're on this overpass here, you'd see the front of the car coming this way, or the front of the car coming that way. There's no time. You'd have to be in another spot to have shot the back of it. You guys get what I'm saying here? It doesn't make any sense. Because here's the overpass of the street here, and that's what they were claiming, but the car was apparently shot in the back of the vehicle. Hmm. That's a weird one there. Oh, yeah? Season 2, there it is? Okay. All right. I know they have lists out there. Thanks, Dan Carr. Yeah, this one actually is pretty interesting, isn't it? Alright, just save that. A crew of nine. The assignment is intriguing because someone was something was troubling her, a graduate. Okay, one on the day of the killing, Hinson went to work as usual then attended the company Christmas party in Hickory with a friend. Afterwards, she took her friend home and headed towards her home at 1009 Hillcrest Street. So she already had taken her friend home, so maybe that's where her residence in Valdez, about 15 miles west of Hickory. The shot, which authorities have said may have been fired with from a high-powered rifle, cut through the car's trunk and seats and hit Henson in the back, a passing motorist reported finding her body. An unsolved mystery crew and local residents hired to portray the Hinsons filmed at the scene Sunday night. About 30 North Carolina residents worked as extras. The program is entering its second season and has helped solve about 25% of the crimes aired. We don't do a story unless we think it's solvable. Somebody out there knows something, she said. Somebody knows what happened to Rhonda Henson. Yep, and then in 1999. Let's see. So this is... Uh, what do we got here? Yeah. So th this was part of a larger article, but it said Rhonda Henson case, and then it kind of winds through here. I just want to see what it might say in there. 
Uh, the last time Caldwell County investigated a homicide in early March, Barlow called all his detectives out to the scene. They scrambled for the next two days until two suspects were arrested and charged. Statistically, if you don't solve it in the first 24, 48, 72 hours, it's going to take months, Barlow said. Sometimes the investigation drags on, and when it does, each department likes to handle it a little differently. In Caldwell County, a detective carries the case at all times, Barlow said. Uh, let's see. Pruitt inherited Burt County's biggest mystery a couple years ago, the shooting death of 19-year-old Rhonda Henson. I just started from scratch and tried to develop my own ideas. Probably a good way to do it. Investigators have used just about every... That's why I don't, like, watch other videos from people on cases that I'm doing. I don't even want to know what, what they thought, to be honest with you. Uh, investigators have used just about every cold case trick in the book on the Henson murder, which gripped Burt County from the beginning. Uh, the SBI and other special teams have been called in on the case just this spring. They brought in four different psychics uh, to work on the case. They have offered rewards and asked the public for information. In 1989, the television show Unsolved Mysteries. This is 1999 right here. The happy medium detectives are split on whether psychics can help. <laughs> well, they, they can't. Okay. Uh, psychic Pat Sishin, a 63-year-old grandmother from Knoxville, Tennessee, actually likes to work with officers who are a little skeptical as long as they have an open mind. Sishin, who calls herself the happy medium, has assisted police with 10 to 15 tough cases since the late 1980s, including the Henson case. Yeah, you, you've assisted, but you didn't do a damn thing. All right, anyways, I don't, I don't want to talk about psychics. So we're going to get off of that. It's almost apple time, you guys. I'm feeling it. I'm getting, uh, getting that dizzy feeling. <laughs> Detectives are investigating new information. And this is today, by the way, this article. So it says, detectives are investigating new information in a Burke County cold case. It has been 40 years since the unsolved murder of 19-year-old Rhonda Henson, who was shot and killed on her way home from a Christmas party. Henson's body was found in a ditch beside her Dotson, less than a mile from her home. The cold case is the most investigated case in Burke County Sheriff's Office history, according to uh, Wissenant. Detectives have retired and other detectives have been assigned to keep the case in the forefront as leads continue to develop over the decades. More data has become available in recent months regarding the case. Hmm, data. I wonder if that's DNA somehow. Hmm. You know what's interesting is how do we know she was even driving at that time? Like, what if somebody got into her vehicle and then, I don't know, I mean, I'm just saying, and then, but, but killed her by making it look like that. I mean, that'd be really tough, though. You'd have to, like, strangle her first or something and then go back in a distance, shoot through there, and then drive her car to the freeway and then toss her body out. I don't know. I don't know. That doesn't sound very likely. That's, that's a, uh, I got a cut off in my own brain on that one, in the middle of that. It just seems really strange. Um, the hours, days, months, and years of work coupled with so many prayer. What would the data be is what I'm wondering. Now. Friends of Rhonda continue to motivate officers to bring justice and closure to so many who knew and loved Rhonda as a goal, the Burke County Sheriff's Office still holds deep with, within our hearts. Details about what new data has become available were not released. Yeah, shit. Judy Henson showed Channel 9 her daughter's bedroom filled with pictures and memories. Every day, every day we remember Rhonda. We think about Rhonda. This is now, man. Judy Henson said, over the past 40 years, we have done everything that was possible. 
breaking Mor Morganton just got this from sheriff deputies about 40 year old murder involving the shooting death of Rhonda Henson detectives are pursuing a new line of information in the case and it says yeah that's pretty cool Uh, this year is the 40th anniversary of the tragic death of 19-year-old Rhonda Henson, who was shot and killed on her way from home at a Christmas party on December 23, 1981. Known as the most investigated case in the history of the Burke County Sheriff's Office, the case has never been closed. As Burke County detectives have retired, other detectives have been assigned to keep the case in the forefront. Over the years, leads have developed and been investigated. In recent months, additional data has been provided resulting in detectives pursuing this case line of information. I wonder if it, maybe they analyzed the bullet or I don't know. The hours, days, months, and years of work coupled with so many prayers for the family and friends of Rhonda continue to motivate officers to bring justice and closure for so many who knew and loved Rhonda. It's awesome. Boom. Well, I guess we'll have to uh, continue to follow it. All right, well, that's it for that case. We don't really have much more to go on, but I'm definitely going to watch the unsolved mystery one. Yeah, I'm going to have to just watch the show. They'll show us every all the spots and everything. All right. So guess what time it is, everybody? It's halftime. It's time for the apple. And this is the time where you can... I'm actually going to go get one because I feel like it. I'll miss you, Dave. With what you're saying, Dan, is um, they said she was shot on I-40 here, which is hard to do. Not on this street right here. All right. Well, this is a time where you can help out the channel by... Uh, and, by the way, it's cherries at the same time. I donate about 50% of the YouTube channel revenue after taxes to charities, all right? So you can you get the stem and all the different bites. I thought they said it was on I-40. They just said that that's where the, the location was. Let me go back and see. Let me, I'll get it open here. That's right, it changed a little bit. Because one article said I-40, but then remember it was NC-350. Hey, all right, there we go. Emily Fultilla took off the the stem and got the first bite. There we go, here we go. Oh, and here's the first bite by Candlely Woodward Stone. <laughs> I don't know why that, it always makes me laugh. Mm, mm, mm. See, here's, the, here's what a real apple sounds like. Watch. Wow, that's MM. Um, I'm going to have to do like uh, three bites for that one. Thank you. MM. MM. 
and Lori Staggs. Here we go. Awesome. Chloe. Blue. Oh, are you guys frozen? Oh, well, maybe you have a freeze frame. I'll have to figure something out here. <laughs> I don't know if the camera died or what, but it's okay, you guys. Thank you, Lori Staggs. Mm -mm. Yeah. Everybody put out some uh, the prayer hands for Steph May again. Is struggling. I don't know where you guys get those emojis, but. No, oh, there it is. I can do it. Maybe I can do that. Hold on a second. Let me. I'll do I'll do a uh, here we go oogla boogla is worth it there we go that's a uh, that's a bite right there hey thanks for all the prayers for here there we go you're missing out on the cute face of Chloe right there my god people Yeah, you like that? Yeah, we, uh, MM, I've been covering Delphi from the beginning, so it's kind of like I haven't memorized at this point. There we go, there's Kit Kat. She's such a cool dog, Chloe is. Jessica Schubach. Oh, and B Mountains. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Did you see that episode? There you go, you guys. You guys cleared the board. Thank you. Cassandra Morris. B Mountains. There they are. There they are. Here, I'll go wrestle. Get them going. Thanks, Michelle Sakura Griggs. Oh, there we go. The battle's on. And Sandra Halford. <laughs> Look at that. Oh. I think she's Yorkie and Chihuahua, they say. Definitely can see the Yorkie in there. Thank you, Matt Pavia. 
Blue's like, can you get out of my face? <laughs> get him, get him! <whistles> Boy, that really got you guys moving there, huh? Yeah. Well, looks like they got really bored really fast. <laughs> oh my god, you see that? They just went, ah, screw it. You know? <laughs> there it is. Two there it is. Season 2, Episode 8. There he is. Tancar the Legend. Back to you, Jim. <laughs> Back to you, Jim. Yeah, do you see how quick that was? Rainbow, Zen Kitty, it was like, okay, yeah, we're done. Thanks. I don't think it looks like a Maltese, like a, as much as a Yorkie. Yeah, like that's a Maltese right there. Other than the whiteness, it doesn't look like that, you know? Like it, hold on, you gotta go to this one over here. Look at that. I mean, that that one there, I can see what you're saying on that, like something like that. Because Maltese look like they're related to, uh, let me show you at the um, Yorkshire, Yorkshire, and a, uh, yeah, that definitely looks like on that one though, yeah. Yorkshire Chihuahua mix. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, well, some of those don't look pretty good. Um, yeah, it's weird too, because she's got the white part. We always, I always wonder about the white, but there are certain shots where they look just like, uh, See, I don't think the other part is a chihuahua, though. Yeah, it definitely does kind of look like what you're saying, so maybe you're right. I don't know. Yeah, I don't see, like, none of these. That sort of... <laughs> that looks like a raccoon, man. You look at that thing. Maybe it's not a Yorkie. I'm glad we got whatever we got. Let me just type in Yorkshire, see how good that. Thank you, Mag. See, you can definitely see the look though here, you see? Like something like that, a little bit, like a, just not something else in there too. Wishing you all have a Merry Christmas. Miss you and see you next week. Hey! Thank you. Merry Christmas. And thank you for the insanely generous uh, PayPal the other day. Very, very kind of you. Let's go back to that Maltese. Now you got me. Uh, doesn't look like the long haired version, but it definitely looks like some of these, right? Huh. Doesn't, doesn't have that kind of hair though. I don't know. It's, it's bizarre. You know you know what? Uh, we sent the DNA into a... We sent the DNA in to a shop. And... You know, you know I, I, I was suspicious when they... They, at, they wanted me to suggest what they thought it was. <laughs> and I said, hell no. Hell no. I'm not gonna touch it. You just tell me what it was. And it came back with just nuts. It wasn't even close. Okay, West Highland Terrier. Uh, yeah. I think that Maltese was closer. The face, yeah. I don't know if the white part has anything to do with where it came from, but maybe. 
Chloe. Chloe. Huh, that's so weird. Yeah, what the hell is she? I might tr spend the money for the, the good place and send it in and see what they say. Hey, let's, how about this? Um, Yorkshire Maltese mix. What would that look like? There she is, huh? Look at that one right there. Come on. <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, there we go. Morky. Oh, that's a Morky right there. That's a Maltese Yorkie dog. That's the one that you were looking at. Look at that. Maybe that's it. Something like that. I don't know if that's it or not. <laughs> oh, man. You know what I'd like to see is a uh, a Chihuahua Great Dane mix. You know, you have this huge dog with this tiny head, right? Like it just... There you go. That looks like that one right there. Come on. That's a Maltese Yorkie mix. That looks like that could be something what Chloe is right there. All right, we're, I think we're getting on the right track here. You know what we should do is, um, I'll, what, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, um, we'll pay for the, the really good genetic test on Chloe, and then we'll have a contest, and whoever gets it closest, you get a, a hoodie, okay? All right, there you go. Yeah, well, it's weird, because Chloe isn't an asshole. She just does twirling loops. Like, I could just go over, let's see. Come on, Chloe. Go, come on. Twirl, twirl, twirl. <laughs> come on, twirl around. Go, okay. I don't know, she usually does like 360 degree pirouettes. She normally does like pirouettes and stuff, but oh well. All right, time to get back to the next case. Oh wait, sorry, that one's the still frame up there. Let me go back to the other one. Yeah, that was... Uh, that was kind of funny. Hold on a second. Yeah. So that's the one that's moving right there. See, there's a, the old one's behind it there. See that? I have both phones set up. The other phone lasts like two hours. This phone lasts like five, so... Sorry, you couldn't see what they were doing. They, she, like, spins around, does pirouettes. Yeah, let's see. I'll do it again. You see that how she like uh, she just stood up and fell over. It was hilarious. <laughs> oh yeah, got really lucky with both of these. What are you looking for, Chloe? You looking for something to eat?
Oh god, it's crazy. <clears throat> yeah, so we can get, let's go over this net this other case now. All right, this one is the Kelly Lane Smith from 2006. Oops, that's not what I was trying to open. It's that one. Yeah, so we, we already start off with just this horrific uh, beginning. In the very first headline, woman out for walk finds body parts. Remains could be linked to skull bones found in French Broad River. Dismembered body parts found in a culvert near the Smoky Park Bridge apparently were dumped there within the past week, police said Tuesday. Investigators are waiting for DNA tests to tell them if the remains match those found in French Broad River a week earlier and a mile north. Jessica Smith said she spotted the remains. Uh, Jessica uh, said she spotted the remains in a culvert about five feet deep while she was walking her friend's dog and reported the discovery to the police. The body parts included an arm and two hands. It was very clean cut. It looked like it had, had to be medically cut, she said. Each part looked like it was in a different degree of decay with the hands being the most discolored, Smith said. It's pretty terrifying. I was hoping what I saw was... Let, so let's, before we do that, though, let's see. Human skeletal remains were found in the river just north of downtown in July 31st. So that's the French Broad River. Let's see if we can just find this general spot on the map. So hold on. This is in uh, North Carolina, again, Asheville. So Asheville, NC. Okay, so there's Asheville. And then they talk about Patton Avenue. Let's see where that is. So that's Patton Avenue right there. Okay. And then they do have railroad tracks that go like that. Yep, that's those. So the body... I'm just looking at this right here. So this is the same spot. See the railroad tracks right here and then Riverside Drive crossover. That should be right down here. That should be Riverside Drive, this one right here. And yep, that's Riverside Drive. And then after it, this crosses over, apparently there was body parts found floating in here. So body parts found on where the hell is it oh yeah on July 31st July 31st 19 or excuse me 2006 right there and then other body parts were found right down here so off of West Hayward Street, I'm just looking at the map, and I think that's it right there. Okay, that's West Hayward Street, and and it's something about another street. Which which one is that? Yeah, River. No, it's Robert Street. So is that what this is? Yeah, Roberts Street right there. And they're saying it's like right 
here in this area a culvert. There. Investigators are waiting for DNA tests. Jessica Smith said she spotted the remains in a culvert about five feet deep while she was walking her friend's dog in a report of discovery. And they're saying the culvert was like right around here. The culvert. Let's see, it's to the right of the train tracks. Apparently right in this area. Oh, I think I might see it. Is that it right there? That's Robert Street. It looks like it's right here or something, but... Hmm. That's where it's pointing to on the map, though. Because if you look at the map, see there's... Um, you can't really see it that well, but that's Robert Street. There's the train tracks. And then Hayward Street. And then they have this little... I wonder if that's what they're saying. It's in that thing. Let's go back down Robert Street a little bit, which is... Apparently, you should be able to go that way. And then is there like a a culvert somewhere? I mean, there there's a, looks like something goes under a drain there anyway. Nah, but a culvert would be something. You have to be able to see it from outside. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't... Uh, yeah, I hate when they don't give you the exact arrow because they just didn't really care that much. Yeah, they're saying it's they put they purposely put in the article that street and this street. Yeah, Patton. And yeah, Patton Avenue is this thing. Then they've got the railroad tracks in right there. They've got Robert Street, which is this one. And they're saying it's a little bit right of Robert Street by Hayward Street. And is that Hayward right there? Which one is Hayward? That's Hayward. So apparently Hayward goes to, so it should be like right in this area, right here. I was kind of thinking it was going to be right there, but it wasn't there. So anyways, we'll just put a pin for now. We'll be in the general area. Culvert. Somewhere around there. I'm sure I spelled it right, but who cares? All right, so then let's go to the next page. Uh, so let's go back to the last one and read into it. It was pretty terrifying. I was hoping what I saw was a bloated sleeve or glove, she said. Police said she remained, the, the remains Smith found off West Haywood Street. Okay, well, you just now told us that it was found off of West Haywood Street, which is right here. But that's not where they pointed to. They had it to the right. Let's just, you know what, let's just start right here and go this way. And a culvert usually, you know, goes under the, is that it right there? What would the hell would that be there for? Almost like it goes under right there. Let me just put a little something right there, but I don't know, you know. Hmm. 
So it's that off of this street. I'm going to go all the way down to the river now and just look. Oops, she said it was five feet deep. I wonder if it was here at one time. You know, let's go up to, uh, so it's 2006. Let's do the Google Maps and try to, ooh, well that was looked different there. So what month we're in, uh, December. So it would kind of look, this is November. Let me go to 2006, right there. That's July. This happened in August. So this is one month. This image right here is one month prior to the murders. Or the murder. So you got the train track right there. They were saying it was right in this location. That, where I put possible right there is exactly where the, the arrow is pointing. Here, I'm going to do something else. Google Maps. This would be awesome if we get a 2007, something like that. So we're in Patton. What's this town again? Uh, Asheville, North Carolina. So Patton Avenue, Asheville. There it is. No, not, I don't want Patton. I want the... Uh, I want Haywood Street. There goes my stomach again. Haywood Street. Okay. There we go. I think that, uh, that looked about right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So down in that corner there. That's Haywood Street. So I see, that's right there, yeah. It actually becomes like Trotta Street right there. But let me go to Street View. Oh, there it is. That's Haywood Street. That's where I want to be, right on that corner. This one has, oh, 2008. Yes. Come on. This is just a year later, or two years later. They said it was off of... Uh, Skull, police lifted fingerprints and have started the search. It appears they were probably dumped. Police said the remains Smith found off of West Haywood Street. So this, we're on, wow, I don't know where that went right there. <laughs> Just shot through the planet, but I had no idea. But uh, the railroad tracks, I, I hope you guys don't mind me. I always like trying to find these little things. Alright, I'll go back to 2008, May. I wonder if it's right in here somehow. We just can't see it. And that's a drain that the culvert, you know, like from out here would go into it or something. I don't know. Anyways, maybe we'll find out later. I'll keep this off to the side.
Investigators are also looking for uh, a, at missing person cases from the area, focusing on people who disappeared less than eight weeks ago. The skull and other parts found so far don't add up to a full body. Nowhere near it, Will Vaughn said. Remains found Monday appear to be those of a white woman, police said, while an autopsy revealed the bones found in the river belonged to a woman who was white and 21 to 50 years old. Missing parts kept examiners from being more specific, Wellborn said. But they did not but they did find that the woman at some point in her life had undergone a craniotomy. Wow. Or surgical incision in the skull. Employees of Highwater Clays had spotted the skeletal remains oh there you go. From behind the business on six hundred Riverside Drive. Okay, that's a, that's probably this one over here then. Let's see. 600 Riverside Drive. Okay, so it's further up than I have it. Right there. So now we have that just totally dialed into that spot. That's where the other remains were found, right there. We still got to, hopefully, we can work on this one a little bit. But they did find that the woman, at some point in her life, had undergone a craniotomy. Um, employees at the high water found her body there. Uh, Wellborn said they had been submerged about 10 feet from the river bank. Wow. Oof, yeah. Imagine finding that. <clears throat> then August 10th. Yeah, but why would a girl walking her dog or whatever lift up the grate? See, I don't think that happened. Okay. Police on Wednesday awaited the results of a search through a national fingerprint database to tell them whose dismembered body parts were found in Asheville Culvert. The answer could lead them to a killer. A woman reported to police Monday that she had come upon remains, including an arm and two hands, while walking her friend's dog near West Hayward and Robert Street. Yeah, okay, so now they are saying West, so that's right here where this is. Right there, and that's, I think that's where the, um, see right in the ground there is that. So maybe in the woods right there, at a certain time of year. Here, let's try to do some, let me know, something else here by just looking at, if we can find something in, Is that a road or a little stream or something? Looks like a road. I don't know. And it's higher there, so that can't be anything. <clears throat> Near West Hayward and Robert Street, just south of the Smoky Park Bridge. So, yeah, investigators also are awaiting DNA tests. Oh, it's just south of the bridge, huh? What happens if you go up here? Can you look off, down? Yep. Yeah. What's this thing? <laughs> Is there somebody looking at us? Um, I don't know, it's gonna bug me now, it's gonna bug me. Yeah, hey Dan, Dan, be honest. You bought the metal detector for yourself. It's like buying your wife a wrench for Christmas, okay? Hey, here's a wrench. It's got, look at these. It's got 16 settings on it. You'll love it. And then I don't, she doesn't have the heart to return it because you bought it for her. And then it turns out where you're using it every day. It's amazing. I bought her a metal detector. Give me, ah. Uh, <laughs> you know it too, Dan. Watch. He'll say, no, she's really... Oh, come on. You're going to... You know, we won't see Dan for like a month. And then, then this video will show up with this guy with a headset on, like, just like these. And he's on the, on the beach combing it for some metal. And it turns out it's the beloved Dan Carr. 
I've got a metal detector. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually gonna try to buy a really good one. I just think it's fun. It's like uh you know, you're walking around, you never know what you're gonna find. Yeah, they are fun. Yeah. Notice how Dan hasn't replied oh there he is. Interesting point, though she's been talking about it for a while. Yeah. Okay, so maybe your wife, it's kinda like the gift of the Magi. She knows that you want a metal detector. But she wants to buy you something else. So she keeps saying that how much she wants a metal detector so that uh, you will buy her a metal detector and then she'll give it, let you use it all the time. You see, it's uh, the gift of the Magi kind of a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be pretty fun. You know, like how everybody gets a metal detector and then we all go out um, on a certain day for two or three hours and we all come back in and do a show. What did you find? Uh, yeah, you can get really expensive ones for, you know, in the multiple hundreds, maybe even a thousand. Then there's those cheaper ones that are like, you know, 200 that are... Okay, a woman reported uh, police on Wednesday awaited the results of a search through a national fingerprint database. Okay, investigators also are awaiting DNA tests to tell them if the remains match a skull and other human bones found July 31st. After the first discovery, police and firefighters conducted a search that didn't turn up any more remains. They waded through the river and led dogs so you can wade through that thing along its banks after finding two sets of remains a mile apart police had no immediate plans for more searches since we've got the fingerprints now we're putting a lot of hope in that wellborn said a search of the fbi in integrated automated fingerprint identification system scans more than 47 million sets of uh, prints once the case Sets uh, gets out of a law enforcement queue. Wow. Police already have used the, the prints to rule out several missing people. Investigators were looking at missing person cases open in the past eight weeks. The dismembered body parts appear to be from a white woman, police said. The bones from the river belong to a woman who is white and between 21 and 50. The skull showed signs that the woman had undergone a craniotomy or surgical incision into the skull. Without a complete body, police said it was difficult for medical examiners to determine the age. Authorities identified dismembered body. Investigators, this is only the next day, so on the 11th, I mean, they just zipped through, got it. Investigators working on the slaying case first heard the name Kelly Lane Smith from a caller who told them Smith had an incision in her head like the one in the skull pulled from the French Road River. With the discovery of several hands and a drainage pipe, hmm, police had fingerprints to compare with those records in Smith's many run-ins with the law. The prints match. The step is to find Smith's killer. Investigators have significant leads as they search for whoever killed the 35-year-old woman, dismembered her body, and left parts of it to be discovered in multiple Asheville locations. Police and family said Smith was a prostitute, but Father George Smith recalls a time before drugs ruined her life. He remembers the sweet little girl he came home to after work, an angel. She was a true daddy's girl, the bright student, the flute player in the Irwin High School band. See how shitty drugs are, everybody? Uh, she could have done anything she wanted. Kelly could have, he said. But nearly two decades ago, she turned to a life on the streets or living with a series of men, some of whom beat her, her father said. She was convicted on charges including drug possession, theft, and forgery, 
according to court documents, and arrested again and again on prostitution charges. Her father feared for her, although he only saw her a few times a year. He didn't want her around her daughter, Nikki, now seven, whom George Smith and his wife adopted. When Kelly's in jail, uh, when Kelly, Kelly's in jail is when I can sleep the best, he said, because you know she's at least safe. And that's sad thing to think about your daughter. He thought she might be in jail when her sister Lisa couldn't find her. Instead, police say parts of her body were dumped in a culvert on West Haywood Street where a woman walking her friend's dog found them Monday. Employees of Highwater Clays employees of Highwater Clays on their lunch break found the skeletal remains in the river a week earlier and a mile north. Tests had not yet confirmed they belonged to Smith, but the skull showed signs of a craniotomy which she underwent after a traffic accident nearly killed her probably to relieve pressure or something like that with only a small part of the body recovered police didn't know how smith was killed detectives on thursday interviewed people who knew her well you could start where she was dismembered maybe that's how she died right i'm just kidding i mean you know people die and you know these wackos the the contest that dan carr won could be what happened here right Let's sing that again, Dan. Let's go. Uh, yeah. National Geographic. <laughs> uh, I don't know of a service where they're doing active outreach with this population and trying to offer them a better way to survive. Talking about the prostitutes have a few resources providing them help. They're, you, you refer to them as sex workers now, apparently. <clears throat> Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get out of here. Uh oh. Getting frozen up again. Hold on a second. Are we frozen? Oh. Whoa. I don't know if you guys can still hear me, but I'm not sure what my computer's doing. It's doing like compare, com, preparing security options. I don't know what that means. Wow. Okay. That was some weird stuff right there. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. Well, I couldn't see anything on the screen yeah, at all. Nothing. Uh, Kelly Lane Smith lived a troubled life. The 35-year-old woman whose dismembered remains were found this week Turned to a life of the streets or living with a series of abusive men. Kelly Smith had been convicted on charges including drug possession, theft, and forgery. Before her trouble, Smith had been a bright... I think this might be similar to the last one, so I'm just going to skip it to uh, 13. To 13. Fingerprints lifted from the severed body parts found in a culvert matched those of a West Asheville woman, police said. Investigators said they have significant leads as they searched for whoever killed Kelly Lane Smith, dismembered her body and left her parts and left parts of it to be discovered in multiple locations. So what's this thing? Oh really? What do you mean you can't verify my subscription? What does that even mean? God. I wonder if I got disconnected or something. Alright, so the next one. September 3rd. Police search for clues, more remains. Weeks after the partial skeletal, this is, this is September 3rd. 
So weeks after the partial skeletal, skeleton and body parts of Kelly Lane Smith were discovered in the French Broad River, Asheville police are still trying to find her killer. It's just a matter of interviewing anyone and everyone and everybody we can, said Captain Tim Splain. He said the department is actively looking for more remains. How Smith 35 died can only be determined when police have more body parts. On July 31st, employees of Highwater Clay spotted Smith's skeletal remains, remember that at 600 Riverside Drive. A week later, a woman's dog discovered a severed arm and two hands in a culvert under, so now they're saying under the Smoky Park Bridge? Really? I don't know. Can you see from here anything? I don't know, maybe she's walking along those train tracks or something. I swear, that doesn't match what they said. They said a pipe off of here. But, I mean, that is near that bridge right there. Police were able to uh, match prints from severed hands to Smith. We're still getting information, and they are still running down leads. He said information is also being shared with the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department. Police also were trying to determine if Smith's death was related to that of a woman found dead in the French Broad a year ago. No evidence has been found linking Smith's death to an open case the Sheriff's Department is still investigating, uh, Dankel said. On April 19th, a kayaker found the body of Amanda Del Pike. Well, let's, let's see what happened with that one. Amanda Del Pike. And there it is. That, so that's the girl right there. The case against Enrico Forti. Is he the Italian Amanda... No, that's not it. Hmm. That was the only reference to her then I guess was that. I mean that's her. I don't think you did, Patty. Uh, Amanda D. Pike was born on January 12, 1977. Her maiden name is Hyatt, and she married... Da -da -da -da. She died on April 19th. We know that Amanda D. Pike had been residing in Asheville. Hmm, huh. interesting. You're talking about this uh, dog? Like a dog hut right there? Yeah. So they were saying it was more like over here. It's right at this intersection. I just didn't see anything right there. Where did you where did you where did you see one, Patty? Go ahead, Patty. Go ahead. Tell me where it was. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? That there was a dog hut? <laughs> yeah, it did kind of look like a culvert the second time around though. Like you know how they get the little I don't know if it's a dog hut or what that is, but that's pretty funny though. Alright, I'm going to do one more shot here, just for the hell of it. Nope, not doing it, not doing it. Let's see. Oh, well, maybe they said pipe? That looks exactly like that. Hold on. Right there, right? Could that be it? Or 
Does that continue on? Let me go. I gotta go. Now that we see that, I'm gonna go back to the that other map here. Where was that thing? Uh, I wonder if it's that thing just bent over. Don't worry about it, Patty. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. I don't know. Do you, you know how hard it is to do what somebody's trying to tell you to do? No, move your mouse down the track. Like, what does that even mean? All right, so maybe let's see what happens in 2012. Uh, 17. Oh, look at that. Looks like it broke off right there. So that was nothing. That's kind of cool to be able just to see that though, how that just broke off and then later it's completely flat on the ground and they didn't care. But actually this is better because all the trees are gone. How about that? What about right there, you guys? That's a little bit of a, a little bit of a culverty right there. See that? What do you think about that one right there? Well, why don't you just okay right here? Okay, hold on a second. So here we are. Let's go up in the air. We're gonna let we're gonna let uh, Patty run the show, but she's only thirty seconds behind. Okay. So you know, you want me to go down the tracks, and where am I going? Wrong direction? This way or <laughs> Ah shit. <clears throat> Alright, so here's the tracks. You know, they didn't point there though on the map that they gave us. It was uh, it was right up in this area. They had a map and they pinpointed it right there. So go down the tracks from here, right? Okay, I'm, I'm stuck right here. Where do you want me to go? I'll wait 30 seconds for the reply, though. You have to say you're sorry. Just give me the direction. I want to see it. <laughs> That's what another reason that rewind mode sucks. When you don't, it's like five seconds. I think it might be that spot right there, but I don't know. Okay, I'm waiting, Patty. You've got the con. <laughs> Patty Barnett, come on. Do I go backwards or forwards? When you changed screens last time, it zoomed out of the location. Ah, oh boy. It, how do you know it was a culvert, though, you know? Yeah. You mean when I was on Street View right here, this this one? Wow, that, look at that. It went back in time when that wasn't even there. Jeez. Or actually, maybe I just landed on top of it. That one? In there somewhere? See how impossible this is, you guys? Okay, never, I, I, I can't do it. 
All right, I'm gonna go right here again. This is where they said it was. And I think there could be something right in there that we can't see. I like that 2012 one. That was good. I liked it. That one right there. Because I think you can see stuff. Ah, oh, man. You guys still don't... Have, okay, that's 2012. This place is whack. <laughs> it's like all over the place. I mean, that kind of looks like maybe something. So if that's what that is, that's what the other one was, right? So maybe that's a culvert right there. Uh, but five feet down a culvert? Uh, I don't know. That doesn't seem like that's what they're talking about. Maybe inside there somewhere. See, I'm, I'm kind of thinking it's in there. We just can't see it. And that's why it's green in there, this water. That's okay, Patty. We gave it a shot though, right? We gave it what you call a whirl back in the day. You said information is also being shared with the bump count. I think we went through this one. Oh, so on April 19th, kayaker found the body of Amanda Del Pike, 28, in the French Broad River picnic area. Pike also had a criminal history with drugs and prostitution. Interesting. Hmm. Oh, now now we get to read something pretty interesting right here. See, we there. I actually found they they put a profile, and believe it or not, it says. Sitting in the basement drooling. It's amazing. No, but act, this is really cool, though. Look how awesome this is. Here is how police describe Kelly Lane Smith's killer after they got a profile done, probably by the FBI, I would imagine. Investigators believe the crime was committed by a lone offender. The offender most likely was familiar with Kelly Smith, her habits, and the various locations Smith frequented. Investigators believe the offender is most likely a white male in his late 20s to late 30s. This offender is known by prostitutes in the Asheville area and will be described as an odd, pitiful, quiet, or just different, but not particularly scary or mean. The offender will most likely live in close proximity to the discovery sites. He will most likely live alone or... <laughs> in a situation where he is not accountable for his whereabouts to another person. The offender will most likely have a limited violent criminal history and will most likely have a history of sexual nuisance crimes such as trespassing, secret peeping, or solicitation for prostitution. He will most likely have access to an older model vehicle in poor condition. Hmm. I wonder why they say that. If he is employed, the offender will most likely have a job with minimal responsibility and limited contact with customers or the general public. The offender may closely follow the investigation and have an interest in rumors and gossip, like all of us. So all of us are um, criminals now. In the, I don't like the gossip part of it. The gossip in the community about the case, the offender may talk about the murder with friends, associates, and family. Comments will most likely be non-committal, asking others for their opinion on how or why the murder happened and who they suspect may have done it. The offender will be interested in what people 
have said to investigators and possibly make statements blaming the victim in some manner. This blame, man, that just, you know, all the wacko conspiracy groups and, um, you know, the, the victim blamers, you're all suspects now. It's amazing. This blame may relate to her known lifestyle and the possible consequences. It would be common for this offender to display behavioral changes immediately following the murder after discovery of the body parts or after press releases to the public. These changes may include anxiety, differences in food consumption, drug and alcohol use, and changes in sleeping habits. Uh, the fear of identification may become a burden on the offender and become all-consuming. This burden may cause erratic outbursts in behavior. He will continue um, to pose a danger to other persons, friends, and family members. The offender may strike out unpredictably against those around them. Most of, often, there is someone close to the offender who suspects he might be involved but does not want to believe their friend or family member is responsible for the killing. Wow. Actually, that's pretty detailed there. Killer profiled in Smith slang. So I think we, we already went through this. I'm going to skip that document, that other article. In October 2006. Hey, look at that. Draws sleuth teamwork. There we go. Voices around the conference room in Atlantic Beach suggested possible motives, methods, and resources the killer would have needed. Hearing about the gruesome discovery this summer of Kelly Lane Smith remains the, hundred and the 133 sleuth from around North Carolina had so many ideas the conference's coordinator jotted them on a flip chart to keep Asheville police from forgetting any. There was a great deal of concern amongst all the officers there, North Carolina Justice Academy instructor John Wiggins said, and they all wanted to contribute in some way if, if at all possible. Now detectives Ernie Wellborn and Wayne Welsh are recovering, are receiving emails and phone calls from investigators who came up with ideas for catching Smith's killer after leaving the October 10th through 13th conference of the North Carolina Homicide Investigators Association. They offered new ideas, for example, about where on the internet or elsewhere a killer could read about his dismemberment. The police PowerPoint presentation, including photos of the crime scenes, wow, they got all that, and a Hmm. That's kind of cool that they did that, though, isn't it? And a profile of Smith, Smith 35 piqued the colleagues' sympathy as well as their interest in unique and disturbing aspects of the case. The prostitute's hands were found a mile from her skull. Workers on a lunch break July 31st saw the skull in the French Road River. A week later, a woman... Woman's dog discovered, so I wonder if the dog like picked it up and brought it back, discovered a, a severed arm and the hands in a culvert under the Smoky Park Bridge. But their map drawing didn't show that. Let me, let me show you guys the map again. Hold on. That was the very first one, I think. Yeah. See, when you look at this right here, let me make it big for you guys. So there's the bridge right here that they're talking about. And here is, you know, Patton Avenue is that one. So it was Hayward and Roberts is where they said the uh, culvert was. See the arrow? It's not really underneath the bridge there. They're pointing. And they even said in the paper it was found at Roberts and Haywood. And Roberts and Haywood is right here this is Haywood and that's Roberts so they're actually pointing to like right here actually so you got here and here and the person's pointing 
right there. Does the car actually, it doesn't go there. So if we go here, they're actually pointing up there. And I'm kind of wondering if that's what this is. You know, there's a little drain there and maybe there's some something going on. Because these are actually lifted if you saw the other one. So water goes underneath it. And maybe that's a culvert that goes underneath there and then comes down this direction. So that's where I'm going to say it is. I'm going to put it right in there. That's where I'm going to put it. All right. I think it's right there. Because that's exactly where their arrow is pointing. Just to the right of here. More, more like right there, but that's what I'm going to say. Okay. Hey, all right. So I feel better now. At least I, f I feel like that's a better choice. Uh, some remains were left in an, in an area near the French Broad River commonly used for prostitution. The whereabouts of most of her body remains a mystery. Nobody was familiar with a homicide dismemberment that was anywhere on the level of what we've seen here. But in, what impressed Wiggins most, he said, was how deep detectives already had dug. The instructor had hoped that at the next annual conference, police would return to, tell, to colleagues how they solved the case. The Atlantic Beach meeting could help, Wiggins said. Thank you, Kathy Frydenmaker. Thanks for the lull crusher. Smith slaying mystery persists. The new head of investigations of the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department hopes to light, uh, light a burner under some cold cases. Detectives are pulling the files on major cases. Um, yeah, let's see which one do they do? Right there. Department officers trying to figure out who killed and dismembered Kelly Lane Smith. Smith's remains are unaccounted for except the body parts found last summer. Investigators still seek answers in several major 2006 cases, including shooting of a 13-year-old boy at his Fairview home and the kidnapping and rape of a woman on her way to exercise at the Biltmore Park YMCA. Darn it, we're going to get through this. Uh, but the slain prostitute remains front and center. It holds nearly a full-time attention of two, probably soon to be three, Asheville police detectives. The Western Carolina University professor last week gave investigators on the Smith case the first impression of what would have been used to dismember the body. Detectives hope to meet the Williams again before the end of the year. Williams lab holds evidence from five cases. Uh, doesn't seem like they're really getting into any details here, but. I mean, they really, you know, it's good to see that they put this much effort into a sex worker case. Normally they just, yeah. I mean, they look at them, but they're triage to the back burner. But maybe the gruesomeness of it wants them to really find the answer. Police continue investigating death of woman found in River. Police say they have gone through interviews in the killing of Kelly Lane Smith as recently as two weeks ago. Smith's partial skeletal remains were found in the French Broad River. Yeah, yeah. Uh, George Smith said police have had little contact with him about his daughter's case. They're still working on it, he said, but they still don't have anything. 2000, we're, we're in October 2007 now, so like 14 months later. Police still hunt for suspect in women's dismemberment. 
the how and why behind the killing of Kelly Lane Smith, her body dismembered and parts tossed in the French Broad River continues to elude investigators. Police were left with only a partial skeleton, two dismembered hands, a severed arm, and and knowledge of Smith's entanglements with drug and prostitution. Investigators have revealed no break in the case and have not identified a specific person of interest, but detectives continue to get phone calls and are now taking another look at forensic evidence back from the state crime lab. Other efforts to track her killer included a request for help during Bella Cher in July, the same event where Smith was last seen alive a year earlier. Her body parts turned up about a week later. The broadcast resulted in some calls to police, but nothing substantial. Forensic um, identified Smith and will bring investigators close to catching her killer, but good traditional police work will be the only thing that will close the case. They have to pound the ground with leather with shoe leather and follow the trail. I just don't think there's going to be any kind of magic, but Asheville detectives who are working the streets for leads aren't giving up on finding a physical link between Smith's remains and a suspect, Splain said. The dismemberment aspect of it and what kind of devices and tools might have been used at this point, that's been sort of our focus. Smith's remains were found in two different locations I'm trying to see if they'll ever give us a little bit more detail. Yeah, 2007. Uh, a woman walking a dog found the hands and arm in a culvert under Smoky Park Bridge. Nope. Dismemberment cases are uncommon, said Kobolinski, who assists investigations in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Well, if you do that, you should know that there was a ton of them on the Long Island serial killer case. Smith's skull was still attached to her skeletal remains. The head usually is severed to further hide a victim. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, so, huh. Wow. So, Smith's skull was still attached to, like, her neck and torso. That is kind of weird. So, it almost seems like there's more of a psychological aspect to it instead of just being clinical to hide the body part. Like the person wanted her to be found for the enjoyment of it. The fingerprints turned up multiple prior drug and prostitution charges. Physical evidence obtained from body parts can lead police to a person. Uh, they can get probably a lot of tool mark information from the edge of the bones. There are different saw types. The university where Jance work maintains a forensic lab nicknamed the Body Farm. Fibers, hair, and bodily fluid found on the body parts can help in the investigation. There is a tremendous amount of evidence you can find on the body. Police have been working with local forensic scientists to find any evidence. Uh, Kelly Smith's father, George Smith, said he's still waiting for the day police have a break in the case and the day he can cremate what is left of his daughter. The body parts have not yet been returned to him. Wow. His daughter was an Irwin High School graduate, played the flute in the school band. He remembered her as a bright student who could have done anything in life. It was two decades ago where she started living on the streets, running in the law on charges of drug possession. Smith said uh, he's encouraged that police are still working on the case. And then... I'm going to go use the uh, restroom really quick, you guys. I forgot to do that uh, when I got the apple. <laughs>
I want to see if we've done the 2008 one. Now, here we go. Warrants. So there was warrants now issued for the 06 slang in this, for this guy named Lewis Kyle Wilson. A search warrant in the case of slain prostitute Kelly Lane Smith. Oh, wow. So now we're going to... i got to read this. Provides a disturbing glimpse into her killing and shines a light on a person of interest in the case. The warrant ex executed December 8th states that teeth and hair, among other items, were removed from a man's residence, oh wow, on Craven Street. Police emphasize the man, Lewis Kyle Wilson, 31, is only a person of interest in the case. He was arrested and charged with kidnapping and assault in another case involving a prostitute in the same area as well as with drug charges. He remains in the Buncombe County Detention Facility on a $115,500 bond. Thank you for being so precise. I mean, I think you should have put like and 32 cents at the end just to round it off as being ludicrous. Uh, parts of Smith's dismemberment body were found in the French Broad River behind high water clays on July 31st, 2006. Oh wait, hold on, I forgot to do something again. Hold on a second. I don't want my wife to get mad, so hold on. You know how mad they get when you don't flush the toilet? A hundred and fifteen thousand. I mean, what a ridiculous bail amount. A hundred and fifteen thousand five hundred. I mean, have you ever heard one that specific like that? We already showed where the culvert probably is, Ozo. Parts of Smith's dismemberment body were found in the French Broad River behind high water clays on July 31st, 2006, including a skull, two tibias, two kneecaps, and a partial left foot. Well, did, the, did her teeth, were any of her teeth missing? And a lower jawbone. The remains were clearly, well, lower jawbone. Hmm, that's weird. The remains were clearly dismembered and most of the teeth were missing. Oh boy. From the jaw, the search warrant states, on August 7, 2006, the Asheville Police Department got a second call about human remains in a culvert near the intersection of Robert Street and West Hayward Street. So that is exactly what we were talking about. So here is West Hayward and Roberts. So it's near there. I actually, th I think that that little raised thing there is probably the culvert. I think. <laughs> you know, I don't really know. Here, hold on. Let me try one last thing over here just for the whole, right, right in here. I don't know, I just think that that's it right there. See, that's a good way to look at it this time. Like, it, the water comes down, and maybe that's like a culvert that runs down to here. Could, could be right there, too, but, you know. The arrow pointed on the map to right here, and it was really accurately at this intersection. So I think it's closer than saying it's underneath the bridge over there. Yeah, okay. Uh, to date, no suspects have been charged in Smith's murder. Several assaults detailed. Police were led to Williamson County after linking him. Let me see. Where, where were we, did we drop off here? On August 7, 2006, the Asheville Police Department got a second call about human remains in a culvert 
near the intersection of Robert Street and West Haywood Street and discovered a right and left hand and part of the left arm that were later identified as Smith's. Smith, 35, at the time of her death, is described in the warrant as a local prostitute last seen by friends on July 29, 2006. The date... No suspect, uh, to date, no suspect has been charged in Smith's murder. Detective Kevin Taylor uh, states in the warrant. Police were led to Wilson's house, so this Lewis Kyle Wilson, after linking him to assaults on three prostitutes this year. A November 19th case led to the first search of his home at now, I wonder if it's related at all to the, um, you know, the Lumberton case, you know. Theirs was much later, but very early that day, police received a call from a prostitute detailing how she'd been solicited to perform a sexual act by, now we've got this really huge article right here. I mean, a lot of people, uh, sex workers are the target of killers, so there's many of them, but I mean, it's the same state, but it's also, I think, 11 years later, but you know, you get a serial killer that's 32, and then 11 years later, they're 41, There's, I mean, in 43, they're still doing it, right? I mean, you, those guys are killing up into their 50s a lot. Yeah, so this is pretty long now. White male in a gold-colored extended cab pickup truck with a camper top. The prostitute... Okay, how does it end there? So down here it said... Solicited to perform a sexual act by a is this A3 white male in a gold colored extended cab pickup truck with a camper top the prostitute later identified Lewis Kyle Wilson who resides at 68 and a half let's see where that is let's see if it kind of makes sense here and remember how they said the killer would live in the area so now we can uh, let's just do 68 Craven Street so come on, be in the area. You got your profile. Oh man, this is, oh shit. <laughs> I mean, he pretty much nailed that one. So let's go back in time in uh, 2006. That's where he lived, right there. Wow, that's wild right there. 68 Craven Street. That's just right across the river. I mean, that that's not even... I bet you that's not even a half mile. In the air. Yeah, 0.34. But you could just dump the body parts, walk right like this, and around, and you're just right at your home. You know, you just kind of... Really simple. Looks like they've updated it, but um, you could just... Back then, you could walk across and... There's a little bridge right there, interestingly. Yeah, like you would just walk over this bridge. And then he lived right over there. It's different now, though. It doesn't look like the way it used to. Man, look how close, look how accurate. You go way up in the air like that, and you go, yeah, he's going to live near there. Well, geez. 0.34 miles? Are you kidding me? A guy right there that attacks prostitutes. I wonder if he fits the rest of the uh, mold here. Let's go through the. She said Wilson drove her to his residence. So he, uh, so he drove a woman, a prostitute, to that house right there, where he then held her captive in an old camper on the property. Hold on. 
Yeah, it's not clear enough. So there, there's the house when you can actually see it. So it was right there. And that was in 2010. So now we're going to have to go open up that Google Earth again. Hold on. Where is it? That must have been a duplex or something. Or, you know, having an apartment inside that house. That's 2008. Shit, that's probably his car. What, what kind of... Wait, hold on. What was that again? I gotta go back to the story. White male in a gold-colored extended cab pickup truck with a camper top. That's not that. spot here? Am I in the, even in the uh, Asheville, North Carolina, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's right there. So, 2010, it's still sitting there. But then, 2013, it's still there. 15, it's still there. 19, it's still there. 2005, and then all of a sudden, in 2020, it's out of there. It's gone. 2019, it's still there. They're probably like, yeah, let's get rid of this place. This so this has a street view. That's 2008. And I guess that's it. In this little garbage house right here, just is. It's pretty crazy because this article is December twentieth, two thousand and eight, and this is March two thousand and eight here. So he's, you know, he's obviously out, but there's another pickup right there. So he's living in the house at the time we're looking at it right here. I would I would imagine. I mean, it's only six months prior to the article here. She said Wilson drove her to his residence where he then held her captive in an old camper on the property. In an old camper. So that must have been his vehicle. Beat her severely about the head and face and stabbed her with a knife while forcing her to perform sexual acts on him, according to the warrant. He later dropped her off on the roadway where she called for help. Why would he do that, though? Police initiated a criminal investigation and found Wilson's truck. Detectives also learned two other prostitutes had been beaten in the same area. On May 11, 2008, another prostitute was picked up by a white male in what she described as a tan-colored extended cab pickup and taken to 64 Craven Street. 64 Craven Street. Where is that? Should be right next to it. Oh. Maybe it's just the same property. <clears throat> Where she was assaulted and raped according to the warrant. The address is a vacant lot. Yeah, there you go. Next to the Wilson's residence. The suspect threatened to cut her throat and throw her in the river. The warrant states. Wow. This guy sounds like a pretty good suspect. If he lived in one half of it, just a place. Yeah, it was just a, you know, a room in the building. That's what I said. On August 6, 2008, another local prostitute was picked up by a white male 
in a gold color pickup with a camper top and taken to 68 and a half Craven Street where she was beaten about the head and face and knocked unconscious. So that was August 6, 2008. That's so crazy because you can actually... So when you go down here... So this is... Oh, so it is still here in this one. Right. But the other one, you actually can see it from the time. This is March 2008. So... You know, he probably lived in... There's two doors here. So, you know, maybe whoever built it made it so that there could be somebody else that lived there. And you got a half for, for the other side. Yeah. On November 19th, police executed a search warrant on Wilson's residence at 68 and a half Craven Street in reference to the assault that day. Wilson subsequently was arrested and charged with assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill, inflicting serious injury, first degree kidnapping, possession of Schedule 1 drugs, typically hallucinogenics, possession of Schedule 6 drugs, typically marijuana, and possession of drug paraphernalia. His criminal record in Buncombe includes conviction of driving while intoxicated in 2003. During the 2019 search, officers took items that included two plastic bags of hair, a small box of teeth, Wow. Knives, saws, guns, handcuffs, leg irons, pornography, computers, and cell phones. The warrant executed December 8th cited evidence of a person participating in first-degree murder in the following premises. 60, 64, 68, 68 and a half, 70, and 80 Craven Street. Wow. First, wow, that's, some, that's nuts. It also stated that Wilson apparently lived in one room, the only one with heat, and that most of the house was uninhabitable. According to a list attached to the warrant, after the December 8th search, officers removed the items, a plastic bag with hair strands and pins, old U.S. coins, foreign coins, and a green bag, and metal box, micro cassette recorder and tape, digital recorder, film, thumb drive, memory card, books, photo album, calendar, wooden box, notebooks, and miscellaneous papers. Also noted was that interior of the house had two open areas in the floor where it appears there has been digging in the dirt foundation. The warrant reads an open crawl space in the under, wow, of the house and piles of dirt or located like he was getting ready to bury somebody in there. The warrant also notes that the locations where Smith's remains were found are near Wilson's home. The area is a known location for prostitution to carry on their trade. On November 22nd, Asheville police detectives Paula Barnes interviewed a former girlfriend of Wilson who said she was physically and sexually assaulted on numerous occasions by him. She told detectives, uh, this man is so dangerous and said she still feared him. Asheville Police Captain Tim Splain, the Criminal Investigations Division commander, said Friday that the department considers Wilson a person of interest in Smith's case because of his alleged assaults against other prostitutes. Uh, the first warrant was issued because of the assault on the prostitutes on November 19th. Because of his violent behavior towards this prostitute, it made us think at the possible connection to the unsolved crimes, including the unsolved homicide of Kelly Smith. There was uh, proximity there between the residents. I see, that matched that profile. And where Smith's remains were found. And he had his own place, right? So nobody would care about his coming and going, just like the profile said. Yeah. <laughs> see, now it's interesting if you open up the profile here. Uh, investigators believe the offender is most likely a white male in his late 20s and 30s. The offender is known by prostitutes in Asheville. He, that's 100%. Investigators believe this crime was committed by a lone offender. The offender most likely was familiar with Kelly Smith, her habits, and the various locations. The offender will most likely live in close proximity to the discovery sites. He will most likely live alone. <laughs> Jesus. In a sit see, these guys are so good at what they do, it's incredible. You know, if this, you know, 
This guy is a great suspect because it matches this stuff perfectly. The offender will most likely have a limited violent criminal history, and that's exactly right. He just had uh, the, yeah, the automobile infraction. Um, he will most likely have access to an older model vehicle. That sounds like that's what he had too. If he is employed, the offender will most likely have a job with minimal responsibility. The offender may closely follow the, inve you know. Anyways, everything we read at the beginning matches. I don't want to go through the whole thing again, but that's pretty crazy. Uh, we haven't arrived at any conclusions based on the evidence found at Kyle Wilson's house. He also said police did not pursue a search warrant after the May or August assault because the prostitutes gave somewhat varying descriptions of Wilson and Wilson has changed his appearance between the incidents. Also in the first assaults, the prostitutes were not forthcoming uh, with police in all details. The small light blue wood frame home at 68 and a half Craven Street sits behind another home that fronts Craven Street. Wait, is it behind there? Oh, is it that thing? Hold on. Wait, let me. Yeah, that seems to be gone in this. There was something else right there. Now, a lot of times when we've seen six, uh, half, it's another building on the same property. So let me go back down there again. So that's 2019. Eight. Yeah, see? Yep. There's a house there now. Right back here. And I don't think that house is there later. Let's look at that one. That's 2017. See, it's gone. That was the house. So you can see it right here. I think that's the one that's um, the half. Right there. See what I'm saying? Yeah, look at that. 2010. That's 68, and I think this is the half right here. One, one, right, one of these, because the one that they were just mentioning was the front right here, right? The small light blue wood frame home at 68 and a half Craven sits behind another home that fronts Craven Street. Yeah, and that's Craven Street, so it has to be Behind here, that's 6,400 over here. Just up the hill from Wilson's residence, neighbor, okay. Just behind another home that fronts Craven Street. A skull and crossbones is painted on a sliding glass door on the room that appears to have been lived in. Just up the hill from Wilson's residence, neighbor Faye Bank was knocked uh, shocked by the assaults. Hold on. Bay Banks. And this is in uh, Asheville. And see. And how old do you think she is? Let's see if that's it. Would it be Craven Street? Arden, 14. I bet that's an older person, that name. There's an 83-year-old and a 41-year-old with the same name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess the 80-something. And she died in 2016 in Florida. But let's see what, if she lived in, uh, there's three addresses, 25, maybe that's it. Hold on.
Oh, yeah, God, do you see that? Oh, man, that was it right there. Holy shit. It just it went bang right on the back of that house right there. That was crazy. So this is where the neighbor, Faye Banks, lived at the time. Right behind, that's that. So this is the house. Um, yeah, I'm going to put another pin because this is 68 and a half right there. That was awesome. That was one of those boom. There it is. All right. So that's where Faye Banks, residence neighbor Faye Banks, was shocked by the assaults on prostitutes that police say took place at the house. Banks said Wilson approached her twice about buying her home. Wow, uh, he seemed like he was a nice cut little fella, Banks said. He was very polite, clean cut. He just didn't seem the type when I heard about it. It just blew my mind. She and her son said they did hear a loud argument in Wilson's yard in August between Wilson and a woman. They were screaming and cussing, said Banks' son, David uh, Schwigman. He said he had few other dealings with Wilson but described him as polite. They both said police searched Wilson's residence and property using dogs and probing the ground in various places. The second warrant requested the use of a cadaver of cadaver dogs and other forensic methods to better examine them uh, for any possible human remains. Hmm. That's uh that guy's pretty interesting, you gotta admit. in 2009 then the articles just die out I mean there's no more I wonder if they just thought he was so DNA match fails in slang so that's like ah shit DNA testing has determined teeth and hair seized from the home of a man consider you know what they should do is forensic genealogy on every damn tooth <laughs> that was in that bag right now and let's see who those lead to. Okay, do they lead to missing people or other murdered people a long time ago? I mean, it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't mean he didn't do it. Okay, but man, wouldn't that be amazing to do forensic genealogy on all the other teeth? Lewis Kyle Wilson remained jailed in Bumcum County under a 140, watch it, it ended up being his, t his teeth and he saved them as a kid. Police executed a search warrant November 19th at Wilson Craven Street residence and seized two plastic bags of hair, small box of teeth, knives, saws, all that stuff. But it turns out it wasn't his. Okay. And then the final article that existed was this one here. A man who police had considered a person of interest in a slaying and dismemberment case pleaded guilty Monday to charges of assaulting a prostitute. Lewis Kyle Wilson was sentenced to 15 to 18 months in prison after pleading guilty to one count of assault inflicting serious bodily injury and various drug charges. But this time in jail will be cut short by 13 months. But his time in jail will be cut by 13 months because of time he's already served. So he was out in like two. Because of time he's already served since his arrest in November 2008. Homecomb County Assistant District Attorney Kate Dreyer said a prostitute told police Wilson held her captive in a camper at his property on Craven Street beating her and stabbing her with a knife. How did that get him only that little bit of time? Is it because she was a sex worker that stabbing was a, a 13 month sentence? That's ridiculous. That's attempted murder. For, forcing her to perform sex acts according to arrest warrants. But we don't know. I mean, I guess if he, you know, the stabbing, where she was stabbed, you could say, well, he wasn't trying to kill her. He was, you know. Police had charged Wilson with assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill. That case and other reports of abuse by prostitutes led police to search Wilson's home where they seized teeth, hair they thought might link him to the 2006 murder of Kelly Lane Smith, but the item's DNA did not match Smith. Prosecutors in the case 
assault case dismissed the kidnapping charge as part of a plea agreement because the victim voluntarily got into Wilson's vehicle. Yeah. Um, that assault charge also, that's kind of, that's the weird part about that case that we just had the other day where that girl went willingly with that, uh, you remember on the, in the Utah on the college campus? So it, I guess it became kidnapping later when he didn't let her leave. That plea agreement avoided trial that would have been hard on the victim. Okay. Uh, did you ask the victim? Seriously. I bet you didn't. So now there's nothing there at all, right? Yep. All gone. All all of those properties. Probably somebody's gonna build a really big build a really big house right there. Or maybe some con business, because there's now there's some business there and who knows? Who knows? But anyways, um I don't know if I don't think they consider it solved, but it just kinda disappeared after that. You know? Yeah, let's look him up. You know? What's he doing? I'm going to see where he's at. Lewis Kyle Wilson. I'll, I'll show you some uh, spots here. Lewis K. Wilson. Yep. And let's see how old he is now. So, see how close that they were. Yeah, so he's 44 now. Minus, so he was 31. I mean, he fit the profile perfectly back then. Yeah, unbelievable. 30 years old. So now he, let's see. So currently, yeah, he lives in North Carolina, but not right there. He lives in this little town here. He, he was using a PO box from '99 to 2006. I was gonna. It always seems a little. Wait, hold on. 600 Merriam Avenue. When people are using P.O. boxes sometimes as their only address in some of these towns, I'm wondering if they're trying to, like people use them now, to hide. So in 2003, he lived right here. And look at that. The crime scene, one of the body parts was there, here, and then he moved here later. So he knows this whole area well at that point. And he lived in a couple different apartments in... This complex over here, same one. Oh, there, and he, there he does have the 68 and a half listed in there. He also has 64 Craven listed in there as a place he lived as an address. And then he also had, oh, let's see if this is prison right here. This is probably a jail. <laughs> Watch this one. Uh, let's see. And what is this right here? Uh, that doesn't look like a jail. You wouldn't put a jail right there. Uh, he, that's an address listed for him, though. Probably a place he worked at. So he does have the 68 Craven Street. That's the first one. 64 Craven Street. 68 and a half Craven Street. And he also lived in, had an address in Ohio. Hey, welcome. It's no telling. Anyways. That's it, you guys. I don't have any more to go, but they haven't solved that one yet. That's it. It'd be interesting to call over there and suggest, uh, hell, uh, we could fund one of the teeth, right? <laughs> That'd be just crazy, right? I wonder if they think that the teeth are all from one person. Or are they multiple people? That'd be really creepy. Yeah. All right, you guys. Well, thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be able to get back on to some true crime instead of having all the wackos in the background. But uh, I hope you guys found that interesting. 
Uh, I did. I thought both cases were really interesting. The first one was amazingly interesting, even though it was we didn't have a lot of stuff on it. But. And I don't think I'm gonna do the uh, flyby or anything tonight. I did a whole show earlier on absolutely uh, two hour show earlier on so mean allegedly, and I'm now tired. So. I'm gonna just sit back and have some mocha or something. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thank you to um, Emily Flotilla. Actually, I was on the earlier show, so let's go to this one. Well, I'll thank them again. Emily Flotilla and LM. And then Cassandra Morris, Zozo, Linda Howell, uh, Tina Susser, Sarita, Cheyenne R. Living it, as in living the dream. Uh, Schnickel Fritz, Vale, Christine Folk, Lee D, Darlene Brown, Randy Bradford, Lee D, Zozo, Christine Folk, Amber Maiden, Lee D, Your Gypsy, Emily Flotilla, Linda Howell, Lori Fisher, Brandy Bradford with a cat eye donation. Thank you. Emily Flotilla, Candlee Woodward Stone, MM, another cat eye. Thank you. Lori Staggs, Kit Kat. Jessica Schubach, B. Mountains, Cassandra Morris, Michelle Sakura Griggs, Sandra Holford, Matt Pavia, Mag, and Kathy Frydenmaker. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, long day, but uh, we got through it. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, everybody? So thank you all very much for supporting my channel. I know we're getting around the Christmas time, but uh, we're going to try to have that almost completely fully funded, the Addison County Doe case at the end of this month. And then we'll just have to toss in a couple of, you know, during the month, maybe 500 here, 500 there. And then we'll probably hit some of the other charities again that in January, you know, like uh, Nick Mac and... Texas EquiSearch, that kind of thing. And then maybe starting in February, we'll start building up another DNA fund. And yeah, it's just going to be awesome. But it's all because of you freaks <laughs> that allow us to keep doing what we're doing. All right. It's awesome. So thank you guys very much. And we will see you guys tomorrow. And, as a, and everybody, again, put out some. Uh, prayers for Steph May who's in the hospital right now with COVID. One of her lungs is kind of messed up with uh, wait, what's that called again? Uh, pneumonia and she's on oxygen but not forced oxygen. So you know everybody put out good thoughts there and also you know uh, you know put out your thoughts for Michael Katz who was the YouTuber uh, lived in the Delphi area and used to cover the case all the time. And you know, he was, he was a funny guy, likable person. We didn't agree on virtually anything, but <laughs> he was uh, he was a cool dude. So, uh, yeah, kind of so kind of a weird day today all around. And uh, but I really appreciate you guys being here. And if you want, uh, don't forget to go over to Discord if you're a channel member. The links in the channel section somewhere in the community section. And also check out the GHI, The Missing Network, on Facebook. Join that group. Uh, Zozo, Sarita, and some others are all over there. Lee D running that, uh, making sure you know they're getting all the missing persons, linking accounts, and it's pretty good. I think what I need to do is um, pick one or you know one case or something a day out of that group, and. You know, we'll even call it. Hey, this is from the great GHI Missing Person Network. Here we go. 
and we're doing that case and then, then I go on and do some of the other ones that I do all right so thank you guys very much we'll see you guys tomorrow and as I always say everybody until next time be safe out there and a two and a three and a four and a five and a six and a seven Hey, what? Yeah, I've been doing this. Hey, thanks, thing. Tina. Like we right know, okay, Jane. Yeah, I've been doing this whole time. I have All she said was it was a great person. show. Why do you have to say Jane? That is a Jane. 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 I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get you on a section. If you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector. Freak and I'm always gonna be a power tech Full deflector, interceptor And I'll meet a better specter with a vector On his pector, with all respect ya Just remember I have a temple fucking check ya I have no agenda, I'm a pretender And I'll serve it to you straight up like a blender And in the end, I'm gonna send ya On a mission to reveal the true offender how about thank you all to the new channel members? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks to all the new channel members, too. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Gee, Gray. Hey, don't whistle at me, Mary Lou. I'll whistle if I want to. I'm going to delete you from the computer. Gosh, Gray, is that a threat that's so mean? <laughs> oh, my God. Are you having a fit? No, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. We'll see you guys. <laughs> It sounded like she was being tickled, but crying at the same time. That was really strange. Yeah, we'll see you guys tomorrow, and uh, be safe out there. All right? Bye-bye. That's right, Andrew. He's so mean. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded so fake. It sounded a lot like one of those YouTubers I've seen out there crying all the time. All right, everybody. Be safe out there. <laughs>